In this video, I'm going to talk about cost minimization, which is a chapter in Varian's Intermediate Microbook. And this is going to be our second, well, it's going to be another installment in our discussion of producer theory. So previously we thought about the firm's profit maximization problem. Now we'll think about the firm's cost minimization problem. And it is the producer theory analog to the consumer theory, consumer's uh, expenditure minimization problem. So the expenditure minimization problem looks a lot like the firm's cost minimization problem, though there, I mean, there's some important differences, obviously, which we will go into when we talk about stuff up here. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna think about analyzing the firm's problem, and we're gonna frame the firm's problem now as one of cost minimization. So for cost minimization, the basic idea is the firm has, we're gonna think in terms of a standard sort of basic one output, two input model, and the firm has some production technology that governs the way that the two inputs are combined to make the output. And so the firm has to decide then, based on this production technology that's going to be governed, the trade-off between the two inputs is going to be governed by our technical rate of substitution. And given the prices of the inputs, the firm then has to decide which of the inputs to use or what, what's the proper proportion or whatever to be able to produce its output. So we're going to say we have some output. Varian likes to use Y for output. I'll use Y, I'll also use Q. Sometimes I'll have the literal production function standing in for uh, Y and for Q. But anyway, so Varian's gonna use Y for output. We have two factors of production. Their factor prices are omega one and omega two. So this would be like the wage and this would be like the rental rate of capital if our two production, if our two inputs were labor and capital. So now we've got the amount of factor one, the amount of factor two, given by x1 and x2 respectively. And this is going to then enter into our production technology f of x1, x2. So I'll write out the firm's problem. Matter of fact, this is the cost minimization problem, but has the same form, of course, as the firm's profit maximization problem, except for this part is going to be minimized, right? The firm's choosing to is trying to minimize profits by choosing the optimal level of inputs. The objective function is this first portion, the omega 1 x1, that's the expenditure on input 1, omega 2 x2, that's the expenditure on input 2, subject to, ST is subject to, using our production technology to hit this particular level of output. And then when we solve the firm's minimization problem, we'll arrive at the firm's conditional factor demands. Then we can evaluate the objective function at those optimals, right? Plug these conditional factor demands into the firm's objective function to get the firm's cost function. The cost function is gonna be a function of the input prices and the amount of output we're trying to produce. This is analogous to the consumer's expenditure function which was a function of the prices of the goods and the utility level the consumer was trying to get. All right, so to see graphically kind of what's going on, what's gonna be behind the scenes for our solution is if we have nice sort of well-behaved preferences or we have sort of a nice structure here and we end up getting an, an interior tangency condition, we're ultimately gonna have a situation where the slope of our ISO costs is going to be equal to the slope of our ISO quant. Well, our ISO quants are captured by our TRS and our ISO costs I'll introduce now, right? So what we're going to do is ultimately I'll show graphically kind of what's going on to give us this tangency condition or in the situations where we don't have a nice interior solution, what we do then. But basically the idea is we can think of all the combinations of inputs given their factor prices that all cost the same. So think about how much you're using of labor, how much you're using of capital. Think about like the expenditure on labor, the expenditure on capital. This taken together, assuming those are our only two inputs, is gonna be my cost. And for a given cost level, there's a lot of different ways to spend a certain amount of money, right? And so there's a lot of different configurations of labor and capital that all cost the same, and they're gonna be all the, the different production, the input bundles that are along the same ISO cost. Right, so the idea with the ISO cost is this will give us the combi Oh, that was unexpected. This will give it, you'll see in a while where that came from. This will give us all the combinations, I wanted to highlight it, where the inputs have the same given level of cost. All right, so this is our expenditure on factor one, expenditure on factor two. Let's just solve this for factor two because when I see this X2 or if I see a Y kind of staring at me, 
apart from like variance y, which is output, I want to solve for y equals mx plus b form, sort of hardwired from like um, algebra class, right? And so I'm going to solve this for x2. This now is our form. This is the form of a line in our sort of standard familiar slope intercept form of a line, y equals mx plus b form, so to speak. This is the intercept. This is the slope. This is the independent variable. This is the dependent variable. Right, and so the idea is this is the line with a slope minus omega one over omega two, and then a vertical intercept of c, the cost level divided by uh, omega two. By varying our cost level, we get an entire family of iso costs. Right, for every cost level, there's a different iso cost, obviously, and all the different bundles along that iso cost that cost the same, by definition of iso cost from up here. Higher C's are associated with higher ISO costs, and we want to think of, we want to remember, the higher ISO costs are less desirable. We don't want higher costs. This is a cost minimization problem, and so we don't want the higher ISO costs. We want the lower ISO cost. The firm wants to choose a production plan that is touched by the lowest ISO cost. All right. So the basic idea is the firm is trying to choose the point on the lowest ISO cost line. And I had written this as P max. I think I do not want that. I want this to be cost min as, as I'm looking at this. And this is, so I'm looking back over my slides and I forgot this was here. This is actually kind of actually unusual for me to teach this from these slides because usually I will have the slides, but I'll just kind of do everything on the whiteboard and the dry erase board and I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the headings there. So anyway, so sorry about that. Uh, our cost minimization pro problem involves our firm trying to choose the point on the lowest ISO cost. All right, well our lowest ISO cost is gonna be closest to the origin. The lowest ISO cost that's going to hit this dark green line is going to be the lowest ISO cost that's gonna allow us to produce the level of output that we're trying to get. Right, and so the optimal choice is where we have a tendency. Now, obviously, you can get a lower ISO cost, it's just not gonna produce the output, right? So think about what we're trying to do. This ISO cost corresponds to a lower cost level. It's great, but it's not gonna give us Y units of output. It's gonna produce something less, it's not. It's gonna give us an insufficient level of output. I mean, you could trivially, triv, you could trivially drive your cost to zero by using nothing. You're also gonna produce nothing, right? So if we're trying to produce along this ISO quant, we are looking for the lowest way, the, the cheapest way possible, which is going to be represented by the lowest ISO cost that touches the ISO quant. So that's here at the point of tendency. All right, so the ISO cost, the cost minimization problem amounts to finding the point on the ISO quant that has the lowest possible ISO cost associated with it. If the optimal solution involves using some of each factor, and the isoquant is smooth, now we've got a tangency condition. This will be our interior solution. If we have sum of each factor, that's this picture exactly. We have a positive amount of factor one, positive amount of factor two, so we're gonna to have to get a tangency at our optimal. All right, uh, given the fact that the isoquant is smooth. So it is, it is only a necessary condition that we have positive amounts of both goods to be able to have the tangency condition. It's not a sufficient condition because you could have kinked uh, iso quant and then but so you'd have an interior solution but you wouldn't have a tendency anyway so let me maybe just go with what i said here because it was brilliant then and is now so if the optimal solution involves using some of each factor and the iso quant is smooth this leads to a tendency condition all right so under these conditions we're looking for the slope of the iso quant equal to the slope of the iso cost Ultimately, it's going to boil down to this right here. We're going to get our technical rate of substitution, which is the ratio of marginal products. And then we're going to compare this to the ratio of factor prices, right? So MP1 divided by MP2 is our technical rate of substitution. And then our factor prices are is going to be omega 1 divided by omega 2. All right, so when the tangency condition doesn't hold, right, when we fail to get a tangency condition, there's a couple things that can happen. One is we could have these, we could have right angle production uh, isoquants. So we could have our inputs being fixed, used in fixed proportions. They could be complements, this sort of Leontief production technology. Or you could also have perfect subs. And then you've got a couple situations where you'd have like a, 
you'd have a corner solution is from perfect subs. So the corner solution refers to using all of one input and none of the other. And for consumer theory, the corner the corner solution was if you're consuming only one bundle and or bundle that involves only one good and not any of the other. Kink solutions, I just mean this is at the right angle corners of our of our our isoquants. All right, so there's some similarities, there's some obvious similarities here to our consumer's problem, but it's not the same type of problem. In particular, just kind of looking at things like graphic, like visually, right? In the consumer problem, the straight line that we were dealing with was the budget constraint. So we just draw a straight line, that was the budget constraint, and then draw a bunch of, well, maybe they're straight lines if we have perfect subs, maybe they're kinked if we have complements, maybe they're curved if we have Cobb-Douglas or, or quasi-linear. But anyway, with the consumer problem, the straight line was the budget constraint, and the consumer moved along the budget constraint to find the optimal position, which is crossed by the indifference curves, which took on different shapes. In producer's problem, the straight lines are the ISO costs, right? The expenditure, the cost, costs are linear, so we're going to have the, we're going to typically have, well, typically have linear costs, and so we'll have the straight lines being the ISO cost, and it's the ISO quant that could be generally curved or could take on different shapes. And so in, we're thinking about the isoquant in some sense as as giving us our constraint, right? It's the technological constraint along which the firm is able to move to find the optimal optimal position. But the basic idea is the firm is constrained by the production technology to be able to use this to use inputs in a particular configuration to get the output it's trying to get. Even so, there's some obvious similarities, right? The process of finding an optimal solution subject to a constraint. Sometimes the applications of, and I'll go through our sort of recipe book for solving cost minimization problems, and you'll see it's got a lot, largely the same feel as we did with consumer theory. All right, so first I wanna go through, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about what the ISO, cost, ISO costs, um, what the ISO quants look like in our, um, in our different types of isoquants, how we'll, how we'll solve things. I said different iso costs. I don't know why I said different iso costs. Anyway, so suppose our firm's problem is to minimize, you know, the expenditure, the cost on to produce this certain level of output, right? So we're trying to minimize our expenditure, minimize, minimize our cost to produce our Y units of output subject to this particular production technology. Right, so we're choosing x1 and x2, and we're trying to come up with the cheapest way to be able to produce this number of units where alpha times the amount of factor one plus beta times the amount of factor two tells us how factor one and factor two are substitutable to be able to produce those y units of output. <clears throat> Excuse me, so we have three cases. <clears throat> so we have the situation where we have alpha over beta is bigger than omega one over omega two. This will be our only x1 case where alpha over beta is less than omega 1 over omega 2 this will be our use only x2 case and then we had a situation where you could use any combination graphically what will happen is we got we'll, we'll have corner solutions here and it'll look really similar to our pictures where we have perfect subs utility the difference here is now we're trying to find the lowest iso costs again iso costs give us the combinations of inputs that can be purchased for a given cost so quants give us the different possible ways to produce a given output. And so what I'll do is I'll talk through perfect complements and I'll talk through uh, some exercises. And actually, I think, yeah. all right. So what I'm going to do is I will talk through perfect complements. I'll go through those exercises. Then I'll go through our general recipe book, which can be a little bit backwards, but I hate to stop kind of in the middle of these slides. So, all right. So with perfect complements, now we're trying to find a situation where we have to use labor and capital, for instance, in the same fixed proportion. This would be like you've, you've got a machine and every machine needs one worker and you can only produce as much output as you have workers matched to machines. And if you don't, then, you know, if you have whatever it is, I've got my ice cream machine, I can only make as many soft serve ice cream cones as I've got people to work on my soft serve ice cream machine, which was part of my summer job at the amusement park. Anyway, so suppose the firm's problem is to minimize by choosing the optimal levels of factor one and factor two, the, ex the cost to produce Y units of output given these perfect complements uh, isoquants. 
In this case, the solution is actually x1 star is equal to x2 star is equal to our level of output. The way that we actually solve this is you'll rather, so with consumer theory, you had to produce apt, you, you had to, when you had perfect complements utility, you would replace the comma with an equal sign, get the line that gives us the ray through the origin through all the corners of our indifference curves and plug that into the budget constraint. We have something actually even simpler here. Now we'll replace this comma with an equal sign and we'll just say x1 equals y bar and x2 equals y bar. We have two equalities. I've written them like this. And what this is telling us is, hey, look, if we want to produce y bar units of output, and our coefficient on x1 is 1, and our coefficient on x2 is 2, we sure better have y bar units of x1 and y bar units of x2. And we don't want any more, we don't want any less, because the amount we're going to be able to produce is whichever is a smaller of this and this. So that's kind of the logic to the solution. I'll go over that in a little bit when I go through the, uh, the problem-solving recipe. All right, so ultimately we want the isocost lying furthest to the left that just touches the isoquant at one point, and we can get whatever is going to be that iso cost. So here's my cost function. Cost is a function of this output. Well, it's going to be my amount of factor 1 times its price plus my amount of factor 2 times its price. Well, I found my amount of factor 1. It's y bar. I found my amount of factor 2. Optimally, it's y bar. I can factor out my output and leave the factor prices. So mixing my economic and math terms together. That's not confusing. So here is going to be my output times my the sum of my factor prices, and that is going to be the cost to produce these y bar units of output. And again, I'll show that in my in my problem solving recipes again too. All right, so first I want to go through these three examples just so that because the, the solutions are not in the slides that I posted. Usually I go over the solutions in class, so here's our class, so I'll go over them now. So, all right, cost minimization. So. We have Bob's pretzel stand. It's got the following pr uh, production function. So there are two factors, factor one and factor two, which are entering as perfect subs. Price for the first factor is 10. Price for the second factor is two. How much will it cost Bob's firm to produce 16 units of output? Well, so the way actually to solve perfect subs is going to be compare my TRS to my, my ratio of factor prices. Well, my technical rate of substitution is just the ratio of the marginal product of factor 1, which is 2, to the mar uh, marginal product of factor 2, which is 1. So 2 divided by 1 gives me a TRS of 2. Good. And then my ratio of factor price is omega 1 divided by omega 2. That's going to be 10 divided by 2. That's 5. Well, 5 is bigger than 2, which tells us my ISO costs are steeper than my ISO quant. My ISO costs are steeper than my ISO quant. The smallest ISO cost that I can, uh, the, the smallest cost that I can use to produce this level of output is going to cross up here. This is like my alley solution. It's my all two solution, and so I'm going to need to use only factor two. Okay, if I'm going to use factor two to produce 16 units of output, how many units of factor two do I need? Well, every one unit of factor two is going to contribute one unit of output. And so I'm going to need 16 units of factor 2. This is going to cost me 16 times 2, which is $32, or 32 units of whatever is this money. All right, so that's going to be the cheapest way to be able to produce this. Now let's just check, just for the sake of argument, what if I had used only, X1, only factor 1 to produce this output? Well, if I need 16 units of output, and I'm using factor 1, I'd, eight, I'd need 8 units of factor 1. Factor 1 costs $10 each. 10 times 8 is 80. That's a lot more expensive. Right? So the solution is I'm going to use all x, or sorry, all x2. All right, cost minimization number two. Suppose Bob's pretzel stand has the following production function, 4x1 plus 5x2. The price of the first factor is 2. Price of the second factor is 3. How much will it cost his firm to produce 20 units of output? Same approach. Let's get our technical rate of substitution. This is the ratio of marginal products. This is the marginal product of factor 1. That's this coefficient. 4 divided by the marginal product of factor 2. That's this coefficient, 5. Four-fifths is bigger than two-thirds, which is my ratio of factor prices, right? 0.8 is bigger than 0.667. So what this is telling me is I have flatter ISO costs. If I have relatively flatter ISO costs, this is giving me my Alex solution, my X1 solution. My smallest ISO cost is going to cross my ISO quant down here. I can produce this using only factor 1. If I need to produce 20 units of output using only factor 1, I need 5 units of factor 1. 
four times five is 20 units of output that I'm going to kick out from this production technology. All right, so I need five units of factor one, which costs two units of money each. So two times five gives me a cost of 10, right? That's how much it'll cost. All right, now the last one, we have perfect complements. So we have Q, my level of output is whichever is smaller of twice the amount of input one and three times the amount of input two. The way to solve this, we create this equality. I said Q is equal to 120 is equal to 2X is equal to 3Y. And then I solve the two systems separately. You're like, where is this X and Y coming from? This is confusing. Well, here we're using Q for output. Here I'm not using Y for output. Here I'm using X for X1 and I'm using Y for X2. And the reason why I did this, bear with me, is because I needed to be able to fit this in. I didn't have a good way to be able to write this side by side. And so this is my first equation. This is Q is equal to 120 is equal to 2X. And this is my second equation. Q is equal to 120 divided by three is equal to, uh, is equal to, is equal to Y. And so I wanted, if I had X2s, the other thing is I can't put subscripts on here. The way that I typed this out just with a standard text box. And so kind of doing this um, kind of quickly. And so I wanted to use Y so that we could say, oh yeah, this is what's happening here. And this X, that's what's happening here. Anyway, so with that explanation, now I'm going to say, okay, 120 is equal to 2X1. That tells me I need 60 units of X or a factor one. And then 120 is equal to 3x2. That tells me I need 40 units of factor 2 or factor y. Well, those 60 units cost 5 each. So that's $300. These 40 units cost 10 each. So that's $400. So now my total costs are going to be $700. Right? Okay. All right. So the next thing that's going to happen is I, I, so, all right. So, the optimal solutions, the solutions for factor one and for factor two are our conditional factor demands, right? This is telling us the choice of the inputs that lead to the minimal cost for the firm, our optimal levels of inputs, depends on inputs and levels of output. These are our conditional factor demands and measure the relationship between price and output and the optimal factor choice uh, of the firm conditional on choosing a particular level of output, right? So these are conditional factor demands. Sometimes you might see that we will see that in variance. Sometimes you might see that a couple other places. Conditional factor demands are the optimal choices of factor one and factor two when we have when we have solved our cost minimization problem. Oh, and this should be a two, right? That should be a two. I don't know. That's that's I don't know, that's kind of that's kind of obnoxious. But anyway, the, so the rest of these slides. So in all honesty, I usually kind of. Uh, switch over to the to the board by this point and so the last thing I want to do is think about did I, did I solve this here I may not have even solved this I didn't even solve this yeah this is one that I do on the board so conditional factor demands this will be one this is a Cobb Douglas basically what, what do we need to do here we need to figure out how to solve a Cobb Douglas cost minimization problem I'm gonna do this better in the the next uh, slide that I'll switch over to in a second before I do that I want to talk about what's coming next I'm going to leave these in the slide deck. The next thing I do is I talk about the link to returns to scale. I don't know. Varian goes into this. Originally when I made the slide, I thought this was helpful and is leading to greater understanding of producer theory. Now I, I don't know. So let me just show this to us. And then when I, so when I would teach this in class, like suppose this was like a normal class and suppose I was not just changing my mind right now, but it's all pretty the slides are published and so everybody's got these and so let me so you're going through the video now I'll, I'll say that this is the type of thing that I probably wouldn't actually well this out this is important obviously uh, so these right here the returns to scale slides I'm not so excited about those I'm actually not so excited about this you gotta be kidding me but this link to profit maximization I think that's useful as well and then the summary I don't know long run and short run part of that's relevant so Long run and short run cost function. I mean, we just know what the long run is. Long run is where all costs are variable. Short run is where there's at least one factor that's fixed. And the interesting thing with the long run and short run, and the interesting thing with the type of problems that you'll see, and the problems that are on the IMX2 is like, if I give you a problem that's like a short run problem, you find the optimal cost minimization pro uh, solution. And then 
the firm is able to take that into the long run world and changes its mind. Right. So then the idea is like it's going to reorganize given the ability to now vary both factors. And that's kind of the cool thing about seeing the difference between the short run and long run version of the problem kind of in action. And so that's kind of like what 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 we care about. I mean, with profit maximization, with cost minimization, there's four versions of the there's four. You know, there's two versions of each problem. There's four versions total. So short run pro profit maximization, long run profit maximization, short run cost minimization and long run cost minimization. And so we'll have some examples of each. The next thing that I did that I did here, this is really following variance super closely, long run and short run costs. This I don't know. I've got this like S notation. This just makes me sick. I don't know. I don't like this at all. So let me forget about this. This is this goes into the. This is a good one, but I don't have this here. Uh, this is also a good one. So this is elsewhere. I shouldn't do this. I should say this is el We'll see. We'll see this one elsewhere. I don't want to write that out. And then the link to profit maximization. That's interesting as well. This is just showing like how. So I had this video where I was showing the link between utility maximization and expenditure minimization. That's kind of what this is doing. And so you can look and see how we link up profit maximization to cost minimization. I'll just show it quick for the sake of the video, but I don't know. If I like to edit my videos, I pretty much only edit my videos if my dog barks a lot and she's not doing that. So I'm not gonna edit this one. I would probably just cut this out and then, but I already uploaded the slides and so everybody's got these. So anyway, so anyway. All right, so the next thing that's really important, and this is like, this is the part we have to be uh, careful about covering. So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna say, all right, we introduced the idea of cost minimization, and I didn't enjoy that very much. <laughs> now we'll talk about cost minimization from the standpoint of let's think about how to actually solve these problems, and this will be more enjoyable. So, um, so, Sort of an sort of an aside. There is. I remember the first time I was teaching principles of micro. I had a syllabus from the other faculty. This is when I was in grad school, and I was like had the syllabus that everyone is using to teach at the school, and so I just taught the topic list. And there's a chapter in ManQ. It's like I don't know if it's like chapter 11 or something. Chapter 12. It's on taxes. It's like the tax system. And I was falling asleep giving the lecture. I was like, I'm never teaching this again. And so I've just never, I've never taught that chapter. And there's actually kind of a lot of things where I'm just like, if, if I'm both bored at it and don't at this level in my career, believe that it's going to contribute value to students. If it both is annoying to me and I don't think it's going to help students, why would we cover it in class? And so that's kind of my, kind of my philosophy. But anyway, so, um, all right, like if it's boring to me, but it's gonna help you, I'll do it. Um, if it's enjoyable to me, but not gonna help you, I won't do it. But if it's, the optimal is like, if it's useful to students and enjoyable to me. And so that's, anyway. So the next thing we wanna do is think about how to solve, how to approach each type of cost minimization problem. So the first thing is, suppose we have perfect complements. Suppose we have Leontief isoquants. So this would be, this again, this is an F. This is like my math, uh, math background F for function. This is my production function. F of factor one, factor two is equal to the minimum of alpha times the amount of factor one and then beta times the amount of factor two. I need to produce Q bar units of output. And this is we. Ugh. We require, well, Q bar is equal to this amount of, you know, however much of factor one we produce or we use times uh, alpha and then however much of factor two we use times beta and then the smaller of the two gives me my level of output. All right, and so then what we do is remember with consumer theory, we'd replace the comma with an equal sign and get the ray through the origin that connected the corners. Well, it's kind of similar approach in the sense of we're going to replace this comma with an equals but i'm going to set q bar equal to this stuff and then i'm going to set q bar equal to that stuff so that's this right here q bar is equal to alpha x1 and then q bar is equal to beta x2 this always comes from the two sides of the comma in my in my production technology 
And then I'm going to say I need x bar over alpha units of factor 1. I need x bar over beta units of factor 2. I can then plug these back in and you can see, just look at it, of course, like obviously, when I plug this back in, I'm going to get alpha canceling alpha, I'm going to get x1 or I'm going to get q. I'm going to get beta canceling beta, I'm going to get q and then the smaller of the two, it's q and q. That's going to be q bar. So that's going to give us efficient production. All right. So then what I've done is I've taken my demands from my inputs. That's these, right? My demands from my inputs, my conditional factor demands that I got as a result of my solving my cost minimization problem. I'm going to drop into my into my costs, right? So my cost portion, my cost is going to be I didn't write it out. So my cost is going to be the factor price, the the price of factor one times input one, or the amount of input one. The price of factor two times the amount of input two that we're using. And then just evaluating, this is going to be, or just plugging in, this is going to be the cost to produce that amount of output. What did I do here? I think I factored out, yeah, I factored out Q. And then this is going to give me the, this is going to give me my input price divided by, like, uh, my alpha, and then my input price divided by my beta. And this is my value function. This is my cost function, right? This is the cost function that's going to then give me, for a given set of factor prices, the cheapest way to produce Q units of output. Okay, so here's another version of the complements problem, and then it's kind of ramping up to doing like numeric examples. So suppose now I had x1 over 2, and then I have 2 as my, as, as my production, as my Leontief pro production function. We want to find the cost minimizing bundle of inputs for a given level of output. So to obtain Q, again, I'm going to set Q equal to this, right? To use this production technology and get Q units of output, this has to be true. All right, so let's set Q equal to this side and then Q equal to that side. This is telling me, obviously, I have to use Q units of factor 2 and I have to use Q over 2, or I have to use 2Q units of uh, factor 1 because 2Q divided by 2 is going to give me Q. All right. What's this going to cost? Well, this is going to cost omega 1 times x1 plus omega 2 times x2. So this is going to cost omega 1 times 2q bar plus omega 2 times q, or q bar. That's this right here. And then solving, just like factoring out this q bar, sure enough, we have our, uh, we have our costs. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the lowest ISO cost, right? The lowest ISO cost that crosses my production technology, like my uh, ISO quant, right? And that's going to happen here. So there's a lot of different ISO costs. There's like higher ISO costs here. We don't want them. Worse ISO costs are to the northeast. Better ISO costs are to the southeast. All right. Okay. So now I want to think about production technology when the inputs are entering as perfect subs. So suppose our production technology is going to be alpha times x1 plus beta times x2. All right. My marginal uh, product for factor 1 is going to be alpha. Marginal product for factor two is going to be beta. My ratio of marginal products is my technical rate of substitution or marginal rate of technical substitution or rate of technical, however we want to say it. Remember, different authors kind of had different conventions. The basic idea, this is slope of isoquant, alpha over beta. And then my slope of iso cost is going to be omega over R. Or I should have used omega one over omega two, but omega over R would be if this was labor and this is capital. But either way, what this is going to do is give us a situation where we are comparing our slope of our ISO cost to our slope of our ISO quant, and with perfect subs, we get three possible outcomes. Right? So it could be this situation where the slope of the ISO cost is flatter than the slope of the ISO quant, and then our solution is like our Alex solution. Use only X, use only X1, right? Here's a flatter ISO cost, a steeper ISO quant. Our best ISO cost is down here. Suppose we have the slope of the ISO cost is steeper than the slope of the ISO quant. Well, now our best ISO quant or ISO cost is over here. It kind of got deleted. But this is where we have a steeper ISO cost, flatter ISO quant. This is our alley solution. Then the last thing we could happen is if the ISO cost has the same slope as the as the budget constraint. It lies coincident with it. So the slope of the ISO cost, alpha over beta, ISO cost and ISO quant have the identical slope. And now any combination of factor one and factor two would work. Remember, with our ISO cost, what we're interested in is we're trying to find the lowest ISO cost that crosses our ISO quant. Our ISO quant is the different combinations of the inputs that are going to produce a given level of output. 
for that given level of output and our configuration of inputs that we're using, we want to find which configura configuration of inputs is going to give us the cheapest way to produce that output. That happens at the particular point where the ISO cost crosses the ISO quant because for this bundle of factor one and factor two, we are on the ISO quant that corresponds to the amount of output we need and the, ISO, the lowest ISO cost, the cheapest way to do it, right? Here, better bundles are to the southwest. With consumer theory, the better bundles are to the northeast. And even though, you know, I like New York, New York City is awesome, I like the southwest better. I like Arizona and I like California. Therefore, I like cost, I like uh, cost minimization because with cost minimization, the better bundles are to the southwest. And for now, Los Angeles is better than New York. And so, uh, wait, here's my picture. Here's my picture in the mountains. And this is me with my Arizona. Um, so anyway, this is not Arizona. This is Colorado. And this is three quarters of a million dollars worth of ore just sitting there. Maybe it's, maybe it's less, maybe it's half a million dollars worth of ore just sitting there. It's not going anywhere. Why? Because it costs more than <laughs> costs more than half a million dollars to get it off that mountain and to process it. So, oh, that's for a different video. All right, this is for, I don't know. So it's like, um, it's after midnight here. And so I gotta get through this video here and then um, make the next one. So. Enough, uh, enough stories about ore in Colorado. All right. So for the Alex solution, how much are we gonna how much are we gonna use here? Well, in order to produce Q units of output using only X, we have to figure out how much X is gonna be demanded. Well, our production technology is saying I can use alpha units or for every one unit of factor one, I'm gonna multiply that by alpha, and that's how much output I'm gonna get. For every one unit of factor two, I'm gonna multiply that by beta, and that's how much output I'm gonna get, and I'm summing, to, summing them together to give my total amount of output. Good. So how much am I gonna use if I use only factor one? Well, I'm gonna set Q equal to alpha X1 and realize, yeah, I'm gonna need Q over alpha units of factor one. What about if I use only X2? Well, I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna have to have Q over beta units of X2. And then what if I use any combination? Well, what if we have this situation where we have the same ISO cost and ISO cost slope, ISO cost and ISO quant slope? Well, now we're going to use any combination to get that level of output. Right. The resulting input demands are conditional factor demands. Well, if alpha is, alpha over beta is bigger than omega one over omega two, right? The slope of the ISO quant is bigger, steeper than the slope of the ISO cost. This is a situation slope of the ISO quant, right? Slope, if the slope of the ISO quant is steeper than the slope of the ISO cost, that was our all X solution. That's this one, right? This is a similarly, this is like our bang for your buck principle. This is marginal product divided by my factor price, marginal product divided by factor price. This is telling me, yeah, I wanna use more of factor one, less of factor two. If they're equal, then my amount of factor one is just gonna be somewhere between zero and then like, like the maximal amount of factor one that I need to produce Q units of output. And if the ISO costs are steeper, now the smallest ISO cost is gonna cross using only factor two, and then I wouldn't use any of factor one. And then by symmetry, these are the demands for factor two, for if we have the steeper ISO, cost, or ISO quant, or if we have the steeper ISO cost. All right, the resulting cost function, well, it's gonna be the factor price times the demand, right? So. If the ISO quant is steeper than the ISO cost, the lowest ISO cost crosses at the horizontal axis. And so then the amount, the cost is gonna be just the factor price of input one times the amount of input one we're using. And then similarly for the other situations. Why, what's going on here? Well, omega one is the price of factor one. Q upper bar over alpha is the amount of factor one required to get Q upper bar units because of that derivation we did a second ago. All right. Suppose the firm wishes to produce Q bar unit or Q uh, 30 units of output. I'll just say that as cheaply as possible using only labor and capital. Given this production technology, find the optimal levels of labor and this should be capital. If 
wage is three and and rental rate of capital is four and then i'll ask question b and c on the next page all right we need our marginal product of labor our marginal product of capital and we need our ratio of factor prices well, the marginal product of labor is two, marginal product of capital is three, so we have two thirds. We're gonna compare this to three fourths, which is the ratio of factor prices. Oh, well, this is a situation where the ISO costs are steeper, so this is gonna be our all Y, our alley solution, use only capital with capital on the vertical. So to produce those 30 units using only capital, the firm needs to have 30 is equal to 3K or 10 units of capital, right? Because if I use those 10 units, I'll insert 10 here, 10 times three, yeah, that's 30. Okay, so what's this gonna cost? Well, this is gonna cost three times zero plus four times 10, this is gonna cost 40. Uh, just to check, if we had produced using only labor, this would have cost $45, right? To get 30 units, if, uh, if we're using labor, we would need 15 units of labor, 15 times three, oh, 45, right? So if we had produced using only labor, it would have cost $45. And so what this is telling us is, yeah, our, we've indeed found the low cost way to produce this level of output. And so we've indeed, like, you know, we've solved the problem. All right, so for part B and part C, this was the original setup. Now, suppose, um, suppose the wage is three and suppose R is unknown. Find R and then find, uh, given the case the firm is optimally using, some positive amount of labor and some positive amount of capital to produce those 30 units, right? Notice indeed, two times 12, my marginal product of labor times 12 plus three times two, my marginal product of capital, sums up to 30 units of output. And then continue to suppose that the wage is three, if it costs $45 to produce Q, uh, 30 units of output, what's the biggest R such that the firm's using only capital? Here, this is thinking about the substitutability between inputs, that's what this is asking about. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is we're going to look at my, comparing my, mar my technical rate of substitution, my ratio of marginal products to the, to the uh, slope of the ISO cost. So two thirds versus three over R. And observing the fact that this is positive amounts of both labor and capital with, per with perfect subs inputs. So we know we have the interior solution. We must have a situation where the ISO cost has the same slope as the ISO quant. Oh, this can only happen if R is equal to 4.5, right? If R is equal to nine halves. So we have two thirds is equal to three R's. And then solving two R is equal to nine, yeah, R is equal to nine halves. What will that cost? Well, uh, let's see. So we need to, we, we are using, we are using some amount of labor. We are using some amount of capital. Well, how much labor 12 and then if i go back up here 12 times 2 right it's 24 for my labor and then three times how much capital was i using two so that's six oh that's this so i have my um let's see i have my three times oops i need two times two times 12 so um i i need my so here we have three times 12 what was i doing so Sorry, let's see. So if I was doing, and then three times two, this comes up to nine. No, that's not quite cost here. What my factor price is. Ah, let's see, factor price. Yeah, well, my factor prices were three, and this is what we found here. Uh, so I must have, I must have screwed up that price, or that cost or something, but all right. Good radio, good radio. So, okay, part C, if, W is equal to three and cost is 45. And my production technology is 2L plus 3K. Find the largest R such that K star is equal to, uh, find the largest R such that uh, we have some K star and our amount of labor is zero. All right, so here we're comparing the marginal product to the price rate or to the ISO cost. We're only going to, we can use only K if we have the situation where we have steeper ISO costs, right? This will give us our all, all Y solution. Well, based on our solution above, finding that we would use, that we get our interior solution, they have the same slope. If R is equal to nine halves, then what's going to tip me in favor of using only, 
uh, capital, well, if r is less than 9 halves. And so if r is less than 9 halves, now we have a situation where we have a steeper ISO cost, flatter ISO quant, that's our alley solution. What will this cost? Well, now I'm going to produce 30 units of output using only capital, 10 units of capital we saw, uh, we saw already. Now here we have my r. Uh, r has to be something less than R has to be something less than nine halves. So my cost is actually going to be something slightly less than 45, right? So if we want R to be less than 40, than, uh, than nine halves, this will be, R is going to be less than 4.5. So my cost is actually going to be, I should have this less than or equal to, because in, in order to, in order to get our all, in order to get our all Y solution, we'd have, we have this holding. Okay, and then the last part, Cobb Douglas worked example. So we want to think about suppose our suppose our production technology is L or square root of labor times the square root of, of capital. The amount of or the rental rate of capital is ten, the wage is forty, and we want to produce a thousand units of output. Let's think about the minimum cost to be able to do this. Alright, so here is our Lagrangian. This is my objective function, this is my constraint. Notice my constraint is going to be producing this level of output given this production technology. So I'll take my derivatives, so take my partial with respect to labor, so this is going to be 40, and then 1 half lambda L to the minus 1 half, K to the half comes along for the ride, and this is going to be with respect to K, this will be 10 minus 1 half L to the half, K to the minus 1 half, uh, because uh, the L to the half is coming along for the ride. And then just solving out, well, 40, this looks like 40 over 10 is my slope of my ISO cost. My, this is my marginal product of labor divided by my marginal product of capital is going to give me, well, ultimately 4 is equal to K over L, right? Halves cancel, K goes to the numerator, L goes to the denominator. Sure enough, so if K is equal to 4L, we can then plug this into our constraint, right? Get our tangency condition. This is a tangency condition. Plug the tangency condition into the constraint and then solve. Well, we already had, rather than Q, we know Q is 1,000. So I'm going to put 1,000 here for Q. Then plugging in 4L for K. Uh, why? Because I'd rather, i like to take that square root. Um, and so now I've got 2. Well, I'm going to have L, square root of L. And I'm going to get a square root of L here. That's just regular L. Square root of 4 is 2. And then solving, 500 is my L. Well, 500 is my units of labor times 4 is going to give me 2,000 is my amount of capital. Total cost is going to be 40 times my amount of labor, 500, plus 10 times my, my amount of capital, that was 2,000, so that's 40,000. All right, now suppose the desired quantity doubles. What happens to costs if capital is 2,000, right? Suppose now we, if we want to produce 2,000 units of output. And in the short run, we're fixed, our level of capital is fixed at 2,000. So what's going to happen to our costs? So this is changing the problem a little bit. This is a variation. This is a different type of problem. This is a short run Cobb-Douglas cost minimization problem. That's what this is. So I should have labeled it. I didn't. This is a short run cost minimization Cobb-Douglas problem. Our level of capital is fixed at 2,000. Our level of output, we're trying to get 2,000 units of output because originally our units of output was 1,000. Now it's doubled and we have capital fixed at 2,000. Okay, so this is Q. This is K. I'm going to replace K with 2,000. I've got it 2,000 here. And so then what I'm going to do is let's see, I've got 1,000, or I've got L square, or L half, 2,000 half. I can write this as, I can write this as, um, 2000 L the whole thing to the half so um, or I could just square both sides if I square both sides I end up with 2000 squared L times 2000 divide through I get 2000 L alright what's my total cost well 40 times 2000 is 80 uh, 80,000 and then I'm gonna get well if I'm if I've got 2000 is my amount of uh, L and my amount of K was fixed at 2000 the cost of this is going to be uh, 20,000. So this brings me to a cost of 100,000. All right, now suppose the firm is free to vary K while producing Q is equal to 2,000. All right, well, we already know the tangency condition. That was K is equal to 4L. 
And now we're just doing is we're thinking, oh, let's produce 2,000 units. So I've got a new constraint. So what did I do? Uh, now we're going back to the free to vary, right? We're going back to the long run cost minimization problem. We're, rather than doing the whole Lagrangian, we're going to get the same k is equal to 4L. So let's skip to that part. Here is my constraint for the Lagrangian I did not write down. It's my new one because we want 2,000 units of output. I'm just replacing the original 1,000 units of output from up here now with 2,000 units of output down here, making the exact same substitution. So now I'm going to get 2,000 is equal to 2L or 1,000 is equal to L. If I want 1,000 units of labor, 4 times 1,000 gives me 4,000 units of capital. All right. And then my total cost is going to be 40 times 1,000 plus uh, 10 times uh, 4,000. That's 80,000, which is telling us, yeah, look, here's the short run version of the problem. It cost me 100,000. When I was stuck using 2,000 units of capital, but we don't want 2,000 units of capital. We want we want to use 1,000 units of labor and 4,000 units of capital. And when we have that proportion governed by my tendency condition, my costs fall by 20,000 down to 80,000. So, anyway, sure hope you enjoyed this video. I'm gonna go ahead and upload it. And given how fast things have been uploading, it'll probably be uploaded by the time I don't know, sometime in the morning. So.